how you react to the issue is the issue. Episode 122. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with architect turned business consultant, coach and mentor, Douglas Teeger, who is based out in Los Angeles. Douglas has had nearly 40 years in architectural practice and has a wide range of experience. He started working for other firms after graduating in 1982 and began his first firm in 1989. In 1999, Douglas formed a partnership, Abrahamson Tiger Architects, which lasted for 20 years and grew a six-person firm into a 32-person firm. Douglas's role there was as managing partner and his ability to effectively streamline the operations allowed for more time to be spent on design and project research. In 2007, Douglas did a Masters of Spiritual Psychology which had an incredibly profound effect on him which has led him to his new career as a business consultant and coach and in this interview Douglas discusses his own spiritual path his own journey into becoming a life coach for architects and becoming a business mentor and how he integrates these two disciplines um, and helps his clients take a very holistic approach to running their business and also creating harmony and balance within their lives. Um, This was a really powerful conversation. Douglas is really skilled in both the business side of architecture as well as the psychology that's needed to not only lead an effective and successful business but also to have a happy and fulfilling life and many of the lessons that he shares here are, are very pertinent and I'm sure will resonate with many of our listeners. So sit back, relax and enjoy Douglas Teeger. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Douglas, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm doing great, Ryan. Pleasure to be here, and thank you so much. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun listening to your other podcasts, and you're a master of what you do. Master, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, great to see you. You've got a, a really fascinating career. You've been a very successful architect working in in big practice. You've been very skilled and developed a a unique expertise in business in you know, business development and client acquisition, and then in say how long have you been a business consultant now uh this is only my first year officially um, i'm my second year yeah amazing and so then you you recently made this this transition into being a consultant working with architects in their businesses and also around the kind of transformational and psychological sides of business so yes really creating a work-life balance and realizing that both professional goals and personal goals are so interconnected mm. that you can't be out of balance and succeed in both. Amazing. So how did this transition happen? And, 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 and what was your career like previously? Sure, sure. Great question. Um, first off, my, I, I think my success has come from surrounding myself with great people mm. and starting with my wife who is just a rock behind me and supporting me all along the way, finding an amazing partner 
who I valued what he brought to the company. Mm. I did start off as a solo practitioner. I worked for eight years with a 300 person company out of New York, a world class architect, Arthur, Ander, uh, Arthur Erickson, doing uh, uh, some great projects. And then a very famous interior designer, Waldo Fernandez, where I did homes for Merv Griffin and the entertainment crowd. And that gave me my high end residential experience. So after eight years of working with other companies, I started my own practice mm. literally in my bedroom of my apartment. And it grew from there, like so many other architects that do so, start out as solo practitioners. The biggest transformation came, though, when I went back and got a master's in spiritual psychology. And that shift of how I approach life and practice just mm. transformed everything. And I have to admit, my wife went through this program first, mm. and I started reading the material and seeing the transformation in her life. And prior to that, I formed my partnership in 2000. For the first six years, I was not home for dinner between Monday and Friday. It wow. was a work competition with my partner. And we both had that drive to succeed and the drive to just want to make something great, but it was at the expense of my personal life. Mm. And uh, after I went through this program, I went back to my partner and I said, let's shift the partnership agreement. You know, if you want more money, you take more money. I want to balance life. And I was able to walk my talk and shift our partnership agreement and be able to leave at five and six o'clock and come home for dinner and leave on Mondays and Fridays at three o'clock to coach my kids in Little League. And I wouldn't have traded that for anything. To have that connection with my kids and be home for family dinner was so important. Well, and I gave up a lot of, of, of uh, equity to, to make that happen. Mm. I was, I was going to ask, what were some of the obstacles that you faced in being able to make that decision or readdressing that kind of balance or the harmony? Yeah, it, it was giving up um, equity and money and saying, mm. I'll take less, but this is what's important to me. Mm. And, you know, looking back, and I have 20 years to look back, I can say the best thing I ever did. Did it... You know, it did it, did it affect your real role in the, in, the, in the business? Did people were like, oh, what's he doing leaving, leaving at three o'clock in the afternoon? I think it was totally the opposite. Wow. I think it set an example of creating a humanistic firm culture. Mm. And firm culture was really critical. And I think one of my greatest assets and gifts that I brought to the company was creating a drama-free work environment where creativity could thrive. We had year-to-year -year growth over 20 years. First of all, I was the managing partner, mm -hmm. handling all the HR, marketing, um, uh, proposals, contracts, government agency work, everything except design and client development. And my partner was excellent at those two things. Um, he was much better at servicing the clients mm -hmm. than working with the employees. So I created this amazing work environment and firm culture that people loved. And we were an office that people wanted to come work at because it had a great work ethic, mm. but it also talked about work-life balance and wanting to have a life outside the firm. Mm. How, how do you go about kind of shifting then from a culture inside of a business, which is very, you know, focused on work, 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 which is a, a common scenario that we could look across the world and see most architectural practices, you know, we, there is this indulgence around work. How do you, because there's a lot of momentum already going in that direction. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think some of it has to start at the school level. Right. I was part of a symposium in Southern California. We're blessed to have 12 architecture schools. I mean, phenomenal. Amazing. And we had a symposium with the deans of all those schools. And one of the questions was asked with the millennials who are starting to shift, what does being an architect mean? And the concept of all-nighters mm. has to shift. And I know when I was at school, there was a ton of people that regularly pulled all-nighters. And I have to say, going through uh, the, the five-year program, which I actually finished in four years, I pulled an all-nighter once just to see what it was like. And I tracked, so I'm very methodical. This is, this is, this is funny because my ability to analyze um, uh, data and, and creating KPIs, key performance indicators in all aspects of the practice, whether it's soft skills or, or technical or, or, or financial, you can still have a KPI. So I kept a little 
a little notepad next to my desk. And, you know, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., I got two drawings done. From 9 p.m. to 12, I got one drawing done. From 12 to 3, I got about half a drawing done. From 3 to 6, I don't think I did anything. <laughs> you know, so realizing that working hard is not the key, it's working smart. Mm. And setting up systems to allow you to work smarter, not harder. Mm. And I really think the break to, um, there's a lot of TED Talks about where does the creative spark come from? And a lot of what they talk about, it comes from outside the office. Right. It comes from just playing in the park, playing with your kids, playing Legos and assembling something that says, oh my God, that's a great idea. You know, how can I use that in this project? Mm. And just getting your, your inspiration from outside the office, as well as creating a stress-free environment inside the office allows that creativity to flow as well. Mm. It's, it's so interesting that I remember one of my design tutors saying to me that, you know, design is one of these interesting topics where in order for you to be the best at it or for it to be the, to come out of you the best, you need to be relaxed. But yes. the environment that we often practice in is not relaxing. It's, it's the opposite. It's a choice. It, it's, it's how the, the culture is established. Right. And, you know, I've been working with a business coach, life coach for the last 10 years mm. while I still had my practice and I'm still working with the same coach. Every professional athlete has a coach. And when you talk about being relaxed, one of what they talk about, especially in baseball, when I was coaching Little League, you have to be relaxed at the plate. You mm. have to be relaxed. If you're rigid, you can't make that first move. So that word that you use, being relaxed, is so key because that really ties into allowing life to flow. Mm. I mean, if you're tight and holding on, life can't flow. If you relax, it just flows. How, what would you say to an architecture or to an architect that perhaps feels that they're not relaxed? Or how can you identify that kind of culture that's existing in your office that needs to be, needs to be changed? Right. So changing culture really has to start from the top down. Right. There's, it's a lot more challenging for a few of the younger staff to say, let's try to shift this. Mm. Because if the principal has firm uh, core values that don't align with the change, then it's not going to change. And I think just the concept, I think one of the most important things is to define your core values. Because that allows you to hire the staff that's going to exemplify those core values. And then you can all be on the same page knowing where you're going and be able to make that change. Mm. But if it's not coming from the top down, it's just not going to happen. Mm. So that's where you have to say, when you start your own firm, this is to the young people out there that are getting ready to start their own firm. You have the ability to set the direction and set the passion and the vision and inspiration for what you want to create in a firm. If you're with a firm that is not in alignment with really who you are, mm. the chance of that firm shifting is not high. Yeah. They really have to make a hard effort to want to shift those, the, the, the culture within the firm. Yeah. No, that's, that's a very important point that it, it's, it's, it's got to come from the top down. It's got to be kind yeah. of permeating through the leadership um, right. and the communications. And that's obviously going to be, that will also have, have a, an impact on the types of clients that you attract, I would imagine as well. A hundred percent. I mean, you're going to, that's the law of attraction. You're going mm. to attract what you put out there. And yeah. even if we come back to personal relationships, you know, if you're with someone that's not, that's not in alignment with your life goals, the chance of it working is, is not great. If you're with someone that just inspires you, that you love that, you know, the qualities in that other person just make you a better person. Mm. It's that one-on-one -on -one feeling that I want to take into the company. I want every employee to feel like, oh my God, I'm a better person because I'm here. And mm. I want that firm owner to feel I'm a better firm because I have you. Mm. You know, that's the, the relationship that you need to have in a, con in a company that's going to create that culture of, of um, inspiration and creativity and, and stress-free. And when you respect each other. And from your role um, in, inside of the firm to now as a consultant, how did that transition occur? Sure. So that, that really came after going uh, through my master's in church psychology, right. which really turns out life coaches. The, 
the end goal of most of the people that go through their program is to be a life coach. So for me, I, I did it just to, I, I saw my wife's transformation. I said, if I can improve my life this much for the rest of my life, why not go through that program? And yeah. it was so transformational. In addition to that, I became president of the American Institute of Architects Los Angeles chapter. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the ability to talk to all the firms in the LA community. And I realized I loved talking to firm owners and asking what's working, what's not working. Yeah. You know, how do you make great design? How do you, what are the KPIs that, the KPIs that are important to you to have a profitable practice? You know, what are your pain points? And I loved that discussion. And my business coach at the same time was starting to say, Doug, you'd be amazing doing this for other firms. And he planted that seed. So I started giving talks on best business practices to the AIA Los Angeles chapter small practice forum. And through that, I had people that would walk up to me after and said, Doug, can you coach me? And I said, no, I'm too busy managing partner. And I had two or three people that were so consistent and came up after every talk that I gave, I finally said yes and realized, oh my God, I love doing this. Amazing, amazing. And, and what is it that you, what are the sorts of things that you, and when you first start working with a client, what are the sorts of struggles or things that they're dealing with and how do you start to intercept those or interrupt those kind of, those patterns? Yeah. So once again, a great question. And there's no one size fits all for this type of work. Yeah. Uh, there's, um, as I've been doing this for the last year, I've been coming across a lot of different programs mm. that offer the same coaching. Yeah. And some of them have a set book that you go through or a set set of videos. And all of that is great information but can you really use it and take it in mm -hmm. and also ask the question, where are your pain points? You know, what is your challenge? What is your goal? I have some firms that don't want to be the big firm. They'd want to stay small, have repeat clients, do great work and have no desire to become a hundred person firm. Others that, yeah, I definitely want to grow. So it really depends on the specific firm and asking the question, where do you want to be? Both, mm. both work and life? And how are those two going to come together? What are your skills? What's your wheelhouse? Understanding that one person, it's rare for one person to be able to do everything. Mm. As a solo practitioner, we have to be pretty good. We have to be well-rounded. But at a certain point, once you're growing, you have the ability to hire better people in different areas and give them the responsibility to take off. Yeah. And that's what I try to help them with. If you want to grow, what are your strengths? What are you missing? Let's find those people that have a better strength in those areas and build a team and then talk about leadership skills yeah. and developing leadership skills. And, and with the, the, the clients that you meet and the, and the architects that you speak with in LA, what are some of the, what are the most sort of common problems that practices are facing? If there was a, a sort of list or is there any sort of similarities to the, to the types of obstacles? Um, I think it's different for different firms. Yeah. Some firms are great at marketing and can bring in the work. Other firms are great at doing the work, but have struggled marketing. Other firms can bring in work, can do the work and struggle with the finance billing, invoicing and tracking all the money. So I like to talk about a business structure that was established through the book Traction by Gina Wickman. Right. Great basic read for anyone starting their own firm. They talk about the four main components of running a business. There's the sales and marketing. You have to be able to bring in the work. There's the operations where you have to do the work. And then there's the finance side where you have to write the contracts, get paid, get your bills paid on time. So there's marketing, operations and finance above that is the integrator that's the firm owner that's really in charge of all those three areas if you're weak in any of two of those you're going to fail right if you're weak in one you can stumble by but if you can be strong in all three that's when you're really going to be able to grow and then build a team that filters down from those three strong areas mm. as a sole practitioner you're really doing all of those so if you don't have the skill set to bring in the work, to do the work, and to get paid for the work, 
you have to hire someone that's better in those positions. And that's where my partner and I had a great partnership because I was really good on the management, finance, uh, marketing, uh, human side. And he yeah. was great on the design and the client relation and, and bringing in the work. So um, it's a great balance. I'm interested in, you, you were talking about, you know, developing a kind of human, humanistic firm cultures and this, and having spoken to you, that seems like it's, like it's a very important aspect of the work that you do. What are, what does that mean? So to me, a humanistic approach to architecture is the work-life balance. Right. And to realize that you, for, for, for me personally, and this might not be for everyone out there, so I'm just speaking for myself. I want my tombstone to say he was a loving human being, a great father, a great husband, passionate about life. He happened to be an architect. You know, so my, I don't define myself as an architect. Mm. I define myself as this amazing human being who practices architecture. Because I feel if you define yourself as something, you're going to be disappointed or you're going to uh, need validation outside of yourself. So I just want to know that I am a great human being who practices architecture, mm. you know, and then has all these other parts of my life. And that's hard for a lot of architects to separate from because they feel their value is how great of a building that they design. Mm. And I don't feel the value is going to come from that. The value has to shift and come from just who you are as an individual. And if you're confident and loving as an individual, that's going to radiate out and allow you to do better, more creative work, to be a better salesperson, to be a better leader. But all of that is coming from a shift of how you're holding that um, humanistic approach in, inside yourself. Yeah. So it's, I am a divine being having a human experience. Mm. My core is this divine, perfect being. I can make bad choices. I can have bad behavior. I can have good days and bad days, but that doesn't define who I am. And it's having that shift really clear inside your head. And that, that for me came about through going through this program of two years of really working those issues and really understanding what, what that means. This, this, so I do work with my clients on that, with that as well. It, it's so interesting. It's, it's, it, and it's very deep as well that yes. you know, we, we can often get, you know, really caught up in the illusion, if you like, of the identity of being an architect. Another and, great word. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and we, we, we kind of hold on to it. We hold on to it and it can really stress us out. And what you're saying is that, you know, that is a secondary thing to be focusing on and actually creating a business where you're coming from who we're being the human aspects of it this actually creates a much more powerful expression for work and a, and a very positive culture for a business to have yes because it allows you to define what are the core values that you stand for right and then you're going to attract people that have those same core values mm. which are so critical and to me, you hire, fire, reward based on your core values. But I think you're also your core values are going to um, reflect what type of clients you want and what kind of clients are going to want you. Mm. And I think it's a step so many of us all skip. Yeah. You know, we did not define this in our firm. Um, it, was, it was just sort of an innate what I wanted to create. But now that I am being able to look at things from a 30,000 foot view, mm -hmm. I'm realizing the importance of it and doing a lot more reading on how do these companies become great and stay great. I mean, good to great is another book that really says what makes a company great and what is the tipping point that allowed them to go from good to great. So, and how to, how to, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to ask, what are, what are some of the skills that architects, can go through or learn to create this kind of humanistic culture what are the because often you know we where we we focus on the hard skills if you like of, of winning the work or of of delivering the design and stuff like that what are what are some of the soft skills and what are some of the kpis to measuring them sure so the soft skills are taking a real interest in your employees mm. just checking in what's going on i mean realizing what are their skill sets? Setting them up for success. 
letting them know um, transparent communication, being able to share with them what is the uh, budget for this project. Now, you might not want to share the actual dollar amount, but I'm even a believer in be transparent, but mm. for sure, share how many hours do they have for this task? Is that a reasonable amount of hours? You might talk to them and say, listen, I took this job because it's going to lead to something else. I know I don't have enough money in the budget. So I want you to try to shoot for this goal, but their chance of hitting it is, is low, but that's on me. That's because I didn't get enough money for it, but I want you as the project manager to do your best to hit this target, knowing that I'm not blaming you if you don't, because I don't think I gave you enough money. So it's having those type of real um, wow. honest, <laughs> honest talks and, and, and just l sharing with your employees that the reason you took this project was for X, Y, and Z, there might not be enough money in it. Or to say, listen, we just scored an amazing job. It's our mm. biggest fee yet. I know we can do it for under this. Let's try to shoot for a target. Even though we have 100 hours in schematic design, let's try to get it done for 75 hours. And that extra money can allow us to buy the 3D printer that we've been talking about. So using that talk to set goals, I, I think most people, let me even take out, out most people. I think some firms just start the phase say, let's get schematic design done without really having a game plan. Mm. I think employees and your staff, and I don't even like the word employees. I mean, yeah. your, your staff wants to be part of the team. They want to be informed. What are the goals and objectives? And letting them know what the target is sets a, a goal for them personally of what they want to try to achieve. Mm -hmm. But what I found is most firm owners say, we got this project, let's jump into schematic design, let's try to get it done in two months without breaking it down. So I think the more specific, open and transparent you can be with your goals and objectives of every step of the way, which comes into defining processes for every step of the way. And I'm a big believer in getting processes up and running. Right, so kind of business systems and, and making sure that everyone is doing something the same way. The same way, yes. Because to me, there's a, a dichotomy that the more disciplined you are, the more freedom you actually have. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I truly admire uh, people that, that are, I'm trying to think of the right word, just let life happen. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, they're, they're, they, they, there's a difference between rolling with it, letting life happen, and being a free spirit, I guess is what I'm saying. Being a complete free spirit. I really admire those people, mm. but that doesn't work for me. Yeah. And it might work for that person, but for me, I can have more freedom when I have more discipline. Mm. When I know I um, need to get these four things done, they're done, then I can do something else. It's, it's, it's really interesting you say that this this kind of the discipline and freedom approach that often it seems like they're in contradiction to each other but actually it, it's a lot easier to have that freedom once there's a foundation of structure underneath and i think so i believe that but that might not be true for everyone so once right. again my coaching is based on what's true for you mm. and then questioning how is that working for you yeah because what's true for you might not be working, might not be giving you the outcomes you want, but it's true for you. Yeah. So then being able to discuss, is there another way to look at this? Mm. This, is the, this is the difference between reading something in a book and just kind of absorbing it as knowledge and actually working with somebody who's skilled and has an outside eye to actually be engaged in that conversation with you to, to challenge and to test and to help you go outside your existing paradigm. You, you've hit the nail on the head. Part of the experience of this master's program, it mm. was experiential learning. Right. Whereas it was very little teaching, but it was a lot of, they would explain a concept and we'd be, we would be in trios. We'd have a client, a facilitator, and a neutral observer. And the two years was spent really working the process and getting true life experience of what it's like to go through that exercise versus just listening to a lecture and thinking you learned something. Mm. Uh, so your word of to experience it, you can speak firsthand. 
to read about it, you're not experiencing it. Hmm. And this becomes quite a holistic approach then to to running a business, um, which I, 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 you know, personally, I, I think is the most important thing to be considering. You know, it's too easy to start a business and for then your whole life then becomes about keeping the business, the business alive and going and the impact that that has on your family. But actually taking the time to design your lifestyle, if you like, and what you want from that and then having your business serve serve the other way around and i'd even take it one step further and saying designing your life yeah and i wouldn't mm. i couldn't picture where i'd be today 20 years ago and i couldn't i was so in the weeds and if my self today would talk to myself 20 years ago that younger person would say that's impossible no that's not going to happen you know i have to just work till seven eight o'clock every night you know I, I, if i let up the business it's going to fall apart you know if i don't match my partner the business you know it, it's going to all come crashing down mm. and it's hard when you're stuck in the mindset where you can't see beyond where you are and that's where i think working with a coach can help show you that maybe there is a different way to look to, to to look at it you know, I never had a coach back then who would say, well, how is that working for you? You know, almost in this laughing approach, you know, yeah. you're miserable. Yeah. You are, know, you happy? You, are you happy? <laughs> well, I'll be, okay. So for me, my biggest learning is I'll be happy when. So I mentioned I finished the five-year program in four years by taking mm -hmm. 20 credits a semester, going to summer school. I want to get done and start practicing. Wow. You know, I'm practicing. I want to be having my own firm. I'm having my own firm. I want to be married. I want to be married. I want to have, you know, it was always, I'll be happy when. So I'll be happy when I get my first job. I'll be happy when I'm with a world-class architect. I'll be happy when I'm running my own project. I'll be happy when I have my own firm. I'll be happy when I'm married. I'll be happy when I have kids. And I constantly push the can down the road instead of saying, why can't I be happy now? Mm. So it's like I'm 60 and I'm just coming into my own skin to say I'm happy. And that's, that's beautiful. And my intention and purpose is to have someone in their 20s and 30s to come to that place of saying I'm happy mm. and have their work and life be in balance how how do you start asking yourself the question about purpose how do we bring purpose into our into our lives you have to want it it's it's the adage you can lead a horse to water mm. you have to come to some sort of awakening that this is what you want or another way to look at it is you know, there are some people that you just want to be around. They just emanate a light and you're just, oh my God, that guy is so charismatic. I, I just love spending time with him or her. Mm. And if you're leading by example and reflecting that, people say, yeah, I want that. And it's just say, okay, so let's talk about how what change would have to happen in your life to make that happen mm. if you don't make a change you're going to keep on doing what you're doing yeah if you start to make a change and once again when i coach i say everything is just an experiment let's try it if it works for you let's keep it if after a couple months it's not working say doug this isn't working sure throw it away let's try something else i don't know what's right for you mm. you know i want to help you discover what's right for you mm. and to to have you say well let's try this idea and sure okay so what's the best way we can set up that idea for success yeah. and try to think through you know what's the plan to enact that and I go love, from there i love i love that 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 culture of taking it on as that finding your purpose as well was an experiment there's a yes there's, you know, there's, there's, there's things for you to test and to try because so many of us um, in, in the architectural world, we end up kind of absorbing other people's aspirations and dreams and goals and we work very hard at accomplishing them yeah. and without actually kind of going through this process of interrogating them. And it's only until, you know, the worst case scenario is it's only when something serious happens that you're kind of either forced and shocked out of it. Quite often. 
and yeah. or, or there's a kind of you know you, you can have the good fortune to start asking yourself these questions and and go on that go on that process right right you know i think just the idea of awareness mm. just being aware that you want to ask the question and just being aware of what is the inner voice the dialogue that's running inside your own head what is your tape what is your story telling you you can or can't do mm. You know, we all have that inner voice. If we sit quietly, is that inner voice a cheerleader saying, oh my God, you're doing great. You're fantastic. Or is that inner voice saying, you know, you didn't do this. You have to do that. Oh my God, that client's going to be pissed at you. Oh my God, your, your you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, partner is going to be pissed at you. You know, is that inner voice questioning you and doubting you and pushing you down? Mm. Or is that inner voice saying, you know, you gave it your best. You did really good. What can we learn from this and move forward for next time? And is, is this inner voice something that we can control or how do we, how do we start getting it to, to be aligned with what we want it to be saying? Um, I'm very skeptical to use the word control because ultimately we have no control in life. Right. What we do have the ability is to choose. And you can hear that inner voice. You can't control it, but you can hear that inner voice mm. and say, I hear you. You've been amazing to get to me where I am today, but I really want to try something else. I want to make a choice today to not listen to you and to try something else. Not in the sense of controlling, but just in the sense of choosing. Mm. Amazing. So it's, yeah. so, so it's like you say, it's, it's bringing that power of awareness that it, it, first of all, that it's, it's not necessarily the only voice to choose from. Correct. That's one voice. And that's the voice that has gotten to you where you are today. And I'm very grateful for that um, uh, drive, dedication, determination, grit, hard work, all of that brought me to where I am today that I can now let go a little bit. Mm. But I think it's also possible to shift it when you're younger. But I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to be resentful that I wasted 60 years to get to where I am now. Mm. I'm saying, you know, I have compassion for that part of me that worked so hard to, to get here. But is there a different way to do it? Mm. So it's, it's, it's a I, very, very therapeutic, cathartic process. That's life. <laughs> You know, life is one big experiment. Life, you know, there's a saying in, in the program I went through that you're in, school's in session and mm. life is one big learning exercise. You know, what can I learn from what happened and how do I want to choose to use that information to move forward? Mm. You know, and even if someone, even if a client or an employee or a partner yells at you and dumps on you and just is venomous, you can be able to look at them and say, I really see how angry, upset, and, you know, just the poison that's emanating. I feel that, you know, what would you like me to do with that? Mm. And just, if you can just stay neutral and see that the other person is not, a, is not um, you are not the other person. You can't control the other person's feelings, but it is, everyone is a reflection of each other. So if they are being venomous, there is a part of you that's holding on to that if you're being reacted by it. But if you're neutral, you can say with compassion, I see the venom, I see the anger, I see the hurt. How can I help you? You know, what wow. do you need me to do in this point to, to move this conversation forward? So, so actually your reaction to somebody's behavior is a kind of reflection on you. Yes. Because you're yeah. recognizing how, something how, that, that you don't like in somebody else that's you or something. That's, yes. How you react to the issue is the issue. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the issue is just something that's going on. The issue has mm. no, um, what, what did Freud say? It doesn't have meaning until you give it meaning. Mm. Nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. Mm. Are you able to give um, an example? Because this is a really sort of quite profound point, actually, uh, and particularly very, very deep in terms of business and how people respond and react to things going on. Do you have a, a, like a, a story or an example of that? I'll give, I'll give two, Thank a business you. and a personal. So 
I had a client that was really upset with the consultants non-performing and we mm -hmm. hired the consultants as an architect quite often we do. And he was just, you know, this is your fault. And, you know, you recommended these people and they're letting, you know, they're causing delays on this project. And, you know, for five, 10 minutes, he just ranted. I didn't interrupt. I didn't say anything. At the end, my first reaction was, I really hear how upset you are. You know, that would really piss me off too. And I take this really personally. Mm. And I'm glad you brought this to my attention. You know, let me take a day, talk to all the consultants, get all the information in line and come back to you because what you're saying is justified, you know, from your perspective. So, you know, thank you for bringing this to my awareness. And I would not, I didn't allow the, the venom to have me be defensive or to fight back or just to listen. And some of the most important words are, I hear you. Mm. I hear how that is true for you. Mm. And I'm careful, I don't quite often put it back. I, I, I really try not to use the word you because you put someone on the defensive. Right. So I really hear you. There it's okay. It's not yeah. saying you're, you're this, you know, I really hear you. I hear how that is so disappointing. Mm. I hear how I let you down. Got it. You know, so it's taking the responsibility to validate what they're saying is true for them in that moment. Right. And then to say, let me really jump into this and come back with uh, uh, the information that you're asking about. So, so it's really, you're giving a space of listening, a completely like non-judgmental space of listening where, and also you're interrupting or being very aware of your own reactions and not perhaps going off down a tangent of, oh my God, how can he be Being saying this? Right, like that. yes, yes. You, just you saying, see, how dare you? That's a, right, right. But saying, you know, yes, you know, that's, that's for you, this is 100% accurate and real, mm. you know, and justified in, in this moment. You know, it could be a whole different conversation. Well, how's that working for you? <laughs> it's a whole different conversation. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's staying present in the simple act of listening and acknowledging I hear you and reflecting back what I hear. Yeah. And similar with, with my wife who, you know, um, a couple years ago, and I, I forget all the details, but I remember her just thumping. And I just looked at her and I said, I hear how true this is for you. What would you like me to do right now? But in the same... Um, sometimes I have a little smirk that gets me into trouble, <laughs> but to, to try, and I think that's just natural, um, but to try to really say, I, I just hear you. I don't know how to respond. You know, what would be good for you right in this moment? Hmm. And to just be authentic that I, that I hear you is, is the three most important words. I hear you. Wow. It's, it's interesting that this, conversation around listening and hearing the other person um this comes up I, li I like i love it when people bring this this conversation up to the forefront yeah. of how how important it is in business and not just business but in our life in our personal and, relationships everywhere and I'll, I'll bring up one other example with with my son who was about 11 or 12 at the time mm. and he loved starbucks vanilla soy lattes so that morning i went out I got home, brought the cup with the plastic top on it, and he wanted to pour it into a ceramic mug. So he kept the top on. And I said, Zach, why don't you take the top off? He said, no, no, no. So sure enough, he's pouring it with the top on. And what happened? Top came off, <laughs> cough went everywhere. And I caught myself. I literally caught myself from the one reaction, my old self being, you know, Jesus, you know, I, I told you. You know, you know, what are you doing? Why are you making the mess? And I caught myself and I said, Zach, you must be really bummed. Can I help you clean that up? And that shift was just magical. Mm. And it's, you know, most people, and that's, this gets back to employees. Most employees know when they screwed up. Yeah. You know, is it worth it to dump on them? and saying, why did you do this? You know, this just ruins my reputation. This is, you really messed up. Why everyone knows when they screwed up.
yeah. as opposed to saying, listen, this came up. It's not how I would like to have our firm be represented. It's not how I'd like to do it. Mm -hmm. Let me try to show you in the, for the future how this should be done. Let's use this as a learning. And if it does happen again, that's going to be a different issue. But I really want you to know this is serious, but I want you to take it as a learning of how you can improve for the future. You're really valued here. I love everything about what you're contributing to the firm, but I'd mm. like to shift this one um, uh, procedure, whatever it is, mm. to be different in the future. And, and what happens when it's, when it's not the right fit with somebody? Or... Oh, so that gets back to core values right. and KPIs. And I have a metrics for core values. You list your core values on an Excel spreadsheet. You have your employee, your five core values. And I like to have an odd number, either three or five. Mm. And then you say from one, two, or three, three is a hell yes. They get this <laughs> core value. So core value is great design. So if it's a hell yes, it's a three. If you have to think, well, they're close, that's a two. If you have to think, if it's not a hell yes, it's a two. Yeah. If you have to think between a two or a one, it's a one. Okay, and then you go through the list of the five and the bar is two and a half. Right. And if they're below the bar, they're not the right fit. Right. And then in addition, there's get it, want it, capacity to do it, which comes from EOS, which right. comes from traction. So gets it. They mentally know what they have to do for this job description. They want it. They really want to do it. Because if someone is a job captain but doesn't like doing details, they get it, but they don't want it. And then has the capacity to do it, that they understand what the job is, they can do it well, and they get it done. Mm. So I, I use both the core values, they have to be above a two and a half, and the get it, want it, capacity to do it, GWC, has to be a three. If they have a two in any of those, they're not the right employee. Right. So that's the bar. And then you might have a few people, and once again, it comes down to another EOS term, entrepreneurial operating system, Gino Wickman's traction, is the um, right person in the right seat. Right. So they might be the right person in the wrong seat. Yep. Or they might be the wrong person. Um, and then it's just time to move on. Mm. It, this is really, this is so fascinating because it, it's, it reminds me of many of the practices that I've worked in where, where, where the, the leaders above have been very proactive and having these types of conversations and then the practices where that doesn't happen. Yes. And the cultures are, are insanely different. Yes. Um, and you know, you get a very, you get a high turnover of staff. You're, if you're constantly hiring the wrong people and ultimately you as the business owner, you're responsible for who it is that you're hiring. Yeah. Um, well, what was your favorite firm and what were the qualities and culture in that office? My, the, the favorite firm I've worked with for was Richard Rogers, um, RSHP, and the the culture of of leadership, of public space, of flexibility, of expression, of legibility. These I still remember the the kind of the the philosophy, if you like, and also him as a leader. And it's interesting because he's re, he's just announced his retirement this week in the last couple of days. But he mm -hmm. was the kind of leader that was in his conversation with you saw your leadership and that always had a very uplifting experience so you know whoever you were he would take the time to sit and speak with you you know and i was a young young architect and then richard rogers would come and have a have a quick chat with you and you were like oh wow that was that was amazing the partners talking to me yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it yeah, was just that's so critical. And, and that's, that's why that, that office had people who were there for their entire careers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that connection. Once again, as I saying, it's mm. getting to know your staff and what drives them and, and different people are driven by different motivations. Mm. Not everyone is driven by money. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, think the millennials are, are, a great example of that you know so many as um I, at the very end of our practice we started hiring more millennials and they would come in and our practice was evenly evenly divided between beautiful custom modern homes mm. workplace environments and commercial institutional um, uh, educational projects and we had some millennials that would walk in and say i don't want to do those homes and my internal dialogue was saying, are you kidding me? 
I mean, you get to design this like virtually unlimited budget, modern, I mean, you can make it anything you want. And they want to do social good. They want to work on the community centers. They want mm. to work on the educational buildings. They want to work on multifamily housing. They didn't want to do these edifices to one person's dream of what a modern house should look like. And I, I, I found that fascinating because mm. for me, my whole first eight years, I can't wait to do my first modern house. Mm. Interesting. And that has shifted in 20, in 30 years. Yeah, absolutely. That's really a very um, interesting point or observation actually about the, the, you know, so many of the practices that I speak to now want to be doing work in the public sector. There is a, a kind of, uh, a, a reluctance, as you say, sometimes to do work for, you know, extremely wealthy clients. This has its own problems as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the public sector is a very difficult, um, I don't know what it's like in the US, but I'm sure it's very it's a similar sort of thing where the, the way that things are procured is tough. You know, you, it's harder to negotiate on your fees. You, there's, it's a lot of competition. Um, um, but yet the, 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 the want to be able to do social good and yeah. to have it work as a business as well, there's, you know, that has its own, its own, how we put it, there's a harmony there to, to strike. <laughs> right. It's the, the younger generation is realizing they want this balance. They want their core values to be aligned with mm. their work that they're doing. Yeah. Amazing. They um, want to make, they, 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 they truly want to make uh, the world a better place. So what's, What's next for you for the rest of 2020? Obviously, we've been we've had a, an interesting year so far. Yes, um, I am so proud of the firms that I'm working with. They are growing. I mean, not one is shrinking. Uh, they're all getting new work via uh, Zoom and remote interviews. They're hiring. Um, while there is challenges for a lot of firms out there. It is um, you're making the most of what you can do in this environment. How do you transition to a remote work environment? Some of my clients were already remote offices with all 1099 people, and that's been a very smooth transition. Yeah. The firms that had to go to 100% remote, I think the pain point is the more junior people are feeling left out. Those more junior people tend to not be in a relation, to not be in a partnership where they're living with someone. So they're alone in their apartment. They don't have, we set up our office where we always put a senior person next to a junior person. So it was a mentor mentee relationship and they were able to just lean over and ask questions. Mm. They'd be listening on the phone of how they're handling correspondence and communication. So that, that partnership, that pairing was critical for the education and learning for a junior person. So now that a junior person is stuck at home alone, they lost that connection. And every firm is having that uh, challenge with the one to three year experienced person yeah. that doesn't have someone to immediately reach out to. Mm. So that's where very good processes can help that junior person. Whereas if you have a task list of knowing what's next, they can just go to the next thing and save all their questions till the end of the day. Because it's very hard to be bothering you know, a question when you have to pick up the phone or dial in or, you know, even using Teamworks when you're chatting all day, that's very disruptive. Yeah. So um, I, I think that's the biggest challenge for firms is the younger generation having the opportunity to just learn through osmosis of being in an office. Mm. It was really, really wonderful, actually, what you, what you said there about the culture of mentorship in an mm -hmm. office. Um, and again, like when, when that's present, in an office and it's something that you're looking out for and you're actively trying to nurture what a different work environment that becomes so let's just put this out there for the onboarding experience for every young firm that's starting to be a leader mm. the onboarding experience is not just bringing someone in and informing them what project they're going to be working on but i really think the onboarding experience is about partnering them with someone more senior in the firm where that senior person wants to be a mentor. Not everyone in your firm wants to be a mentor. Right. So who are the people that want to be a mentor? Take that junior person out to lunch for that whole week. You know, invite other people in the office to join you. So it's not just you and him, but you know, you go with three or four people 
every week, then they get to have a one-on-one -on -one lunch with everyone in the office by the end of the week mm. or two weeks, you know, to really take them under your wing and make that part of the onboarding experience. Mm. And I don't think every firm does that level of onboarding. It's usually, you know, fill out your W-2s, your paperwork, your I-9, you know, you know, what deductions do you want? And uh, here's the project, here's the file system. Okay, get going. Yep, yep, you know, let's yep. see what you can do. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that's the most effective form of onboarding. Mm, amazing. Brilliant. Yeah. Douglas, thank you so much. I think it's a, a great place to conclude our conversation there. There's been some real nuggets of, of wisdom and such a refreshing and powerful approach to, to running a business and how important it is to, to, to take the kind of 30,000 foot view of your operations and also your life and how, yes. and how, the, how everything is kind of you know, interconnected. Yeah, and I think that's the power of working with a coach because prior to a coach, I didn't have the ability to get out of the weeds mm. to actually perform all the work and be out of the weeds. So mm. I think you're absolutely right. I really appreciate it. This has been so much fun. Uh, you know, Ryan, you're so good at what you do. And, Thank you. Uh, you're, I, I really admire how you um, have have taken this uh, podcast out to the world and, and shared and the people you bring on are just fantastic. So thank My you. absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And if people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, email. Uh, email. DT at DouglasTeager.com. I think you can maybe post that at the end of the podcast. I'll, I'll post that in the information. Amazing. Perfect. Douglas. And anyone that wants to reach out, just reach out. Be happy to uh, talk to you. Beautiful. Douglas, thank you so much. Fine. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.